Without any further ado, then, we will hear from Another beer. our speaker tonight, Jack Altshuler. And Jack will tell us something about money, politics, and democracy. Uh, the move to a man. Uh, it's apparently big money and politics. Uh, effects of uh, Supreme Court decisions on democracy and current efforts for a better balance between the uh, big money and democracy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. Yeah, I, uh, I am. Oh, um, right. okay. All right, how's that? Is that better? Yes. yes. Much better. Yes. Well, I am involved with Move to Amend. It is one of the fine organizations that is working to make a difference, to make a difference in our democracy, in our politics, and how all of it affects you. Let me hit the go button here. There we go. Okay. So now everybody's welcome because it says welcome. <laughs> So let me let me just give you a little orientation piece this way. I gave you a five and you get it. Okay, can everybody see if can I stand here? Four back. This yes. good? Okay. Let me give you a little orientation to what I'm going to talk about today. We're really talking about what brought us to where we are now with regard to our politics and the funding of our politics and the effect of that funding. We'll talk about where we are now. What do we have now? What's going on now? How does it affect you? And finally, we'll talk about what you can do about it, just in case you don't like what we have right now. I will tell you, it is about the money in politics. It's about big money in politics. Money that's growing exponentially and threatens to become even bigger. We'll talk about campaign contributions to candidates. We'll talk about contributions to and spending by third-party organizations. You've heard of super PACs. We'll talk about the lobbying of legislators, and we'll talk about the revolving door, the, uh, the um, Congress industry revolving door. That affects what goes on here as well. Let's start with this. Let's start with the Constitution. The top, con have you read the Constitution? You seen it? Yes. This is it. This is it. You're looking at it. You see a thin little book? Like my it's pretty much like that. It's, this is actually more than the Constitution. There's the Declaration of Independence, the Articles in Confed Confederation, and some commentary. The Constitution itself consti is, is only about half of this. There's not that much there. It's a pretty easy read. It's written in very simple language, easy to understand. And it talks about people. It talks about persons. It talks about citizens. You need that higher? All right, good. Excellent idea. That's too high, Ron. Is that better? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. My wings always belly aching about the Constitution. How many adults did it, does it take to aim a camera projector? All right. The Constitution talks about people, persons, and citizens. How many times? 73 times. I want you to get the context in which the, those three words are used. It is, people have rights. That's how the Constitution, Constitution talks about human beings. It also talks about government, legislature, Congress. 118 times that's mentioned. Here's the context for government, legislature, and context. It is a duties, obligations, and limitations. The Constitution puts limitations on what government can do and so forth. How about corporations, businesses, and organizations? How many times are those mentioned in the Constitution? Zero. Zero times. Exactly zero. They are not even contemplated by the Constitution. That turns out to be a pretty important thing. I want to show you a little bit of legislation. Listen, it, it just stands to reason. It's common sense. Excess money in politics can have a corrupting influence. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, well, we've had a lot of legislation, the effect of which was to limit the influence of big money in politics. And I'm going to give you an example of a half dozen. 1907, the Tillman Act prohibited corporations from contributing to political campaigns. Why do you think they would pass a law like that? It's, it's just huge. Corporations have big money, and they can unduly influence elections. That's why. 
1947, the Taft-Hartley Act, there were many provisions of it, but one of them was to prohibit unions and corporations from spending money to influence elections. The term nowadays for influencing election is electioneering. Electioneering, we're gonna look at that a few times in just a moment. Since 1971, the Federal Election Campaign Act, it set limits on campaign contributions to candidates, and it required disclosure of those contributions. Again, it's, it's the, the sunshine principle. And no, we don't want anyone having too much influence on our politics. That was 1971. Not long after that, 1990, there's a case in Michigan. That these others, these are all, all uh, uh, federal. There's a case in Michigan that went to the Michigan Supreme Court, Austin v. Uh, Michigan Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce had limit had a, a law that limit contra limited contributions that uh, that corporates corporations could make to political campaigns. And this fellow Austin challenged that. And at the Supreme Court level, the decision came down to uphold the law. Now, and a direct quote from the majority opinion of the Michigan State Supreme Court. Corporation, corporate wealth can unfairly influence elections. Now that's part of the decision, part of the, uh, the justices uh, 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 comments is the, by the uh, majority of the justices deciding that. It's kind of a forehead slapper. Of course corporate wealth can unduly influence elections. In 2002 there was the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act commonly called McCain-Feingold. Now I know you've heard of this. There were many provisions of it, but it, there was additional regulation of the financing of political campaigns and electioneering. And that electioneering piece turns out to be pivotal for our times. I'll show you that in just a moment. Last piece I want to show you is McConnell v. FEC. That's McConnell as in current Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell. He challenged McCain Feingold. He didn't like that there were limitations placed on campaign contributions, and he challenged it, and his challenge was lost. The Supreme Court sided with McCain-Feingold, all provisions of which were upheld under that suit. So these are a number of pieces of legislation and judicial decisions, all designed to limit money influence in our politics. Now, I want to give you a few more background pieces here. The 14th Amendment was passed, ratified, in 1868. And here's the beginning of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. It states that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall obligate the, abridge the privileges or, or, or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Get that? Due process. That's a due process clause. It's found elsewhere in the Constitution, too. Nor denied any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's the equal protection clause. Look at the date of the 14th Amendment. What was the purpose of it? Reconstruction. This was to give protection to the now freed former slaves. That's the intent of the 14th Amendment. And the 13th as well. And the 15th. The three were ratified in the uh, Reconstruction period. It happened in a hurry. This was an effort to protect former slaves. That's the point. We're going to come back to that in just a moment, too. I want to tell you about a lawsuit that made it to the Supreme Court of the United States, Santa Clara County versus the Southern Pacific Railroad. Now, this turned out to be a very interesting case. The basis, uh, basics were this. In 1878, the state of California ratified its own state constitution, and in that constitution, for purposes of revenue for the state, interest expense was not deductible. Well, the Southern Pacific Railroad didn't like that. They wanted to be able to deduct interest expense to minimize their tax burden. And when that law came about, that, constant, that part of the California Constitution came about, the Southern Pacific Railroad balked. In fact, they balked so much, they failed to pay any taxes or even file returns for three years. At last, Santa Clara County had had enough, and they filed suit to cause the Southern Pacific Railroad to have to pay their taxes. And the case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, the defense in this case, the Southern Pacific Railroad said, look, federal law says that we can deduct interest costs. And in all cases, if there is a dispute between federal law and state law, federal law prevails. That was their defense. 
And in point of fact, they prevailed in this case. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time was a fellow by the name of Morrison Rennick Waite. He was at the end of his term on the court. In fact, he was a sickly man. This is one of the last cases that he heard. He didn't have a whole lot of energy for it. And in fact, this is a pretty boring case. It was just a tax jurisdiction dispute. That's all it was. And Justice, Chief Justice Waite turned out to be a big player in this. Interesting as that might sound. The Chief Justice wasn't particularly important in this decision. I'll tell you who was. The court reporter. His name was Mr. J.C. Bancroft Davis. Back then, court reporters had a much more prestigious job than court reporters today. Court reporters today have largely a stenographic function. They had that function back then, too. But it was actually a position of esteem. And the court reporters were able to publish the proceedings of the court, collect royalties from them. It was a very, very nice job. In fact, the court reporter, Mr. J.C. Bancroft Davis, earned more money every year than Chief Justice Waite. So, the court reporter turned out to be important, and I'll show you why. The court reporter gets to write head notes. Head notes are what go into the write-up of a case at the very beginning. The purpose of head notes is to provide orientation for what comes next, so a reader sometime in the future will have some context for what's being done, what's being written. It has no force of law and is merely the viewpoint of the court reporter. They aren't even the words of any of the justices on the Supreme Court. And here is what Mr. J.C. Bancroft wrote in the head notes of the case of Santa Clara County versus the Southern Pacific Railroad. He said the defendant corporations, that is the Southern Pacific Railroad, are persons within the intent of the clause of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. He wrote that in the head note. It was not part of the proceedings in this case. It was not a part of a any of the justices' opinions. It is merely an orienting comment on the part of the court reporter. Where he got that from is not particularly important. What is important is that he wrote it, and for some reason unknown to any of us now, that got picked up. It got picked up such that this simple tax jurisdiction case was mistakenly used to sh give corporations the same rights as you flesh and blood human beings. And it's been used to support corporate personhood ever since that time. Bear in mind, one more time, those words were written by a person who had no force of law behind him. The words have no force of law, but they have been used as though they did. And that has given us corporate personhood. One more case I want to tell you about, and you're going to understand why there's so much money in politics. Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976. The facts of the case aren't terribly important. What is important is that Buckley won, and they rejected some of the limits of the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971. Specifically, there were limits on campaign expenditures, expenditures from a campaign candidate's personal funds, independent expenditures by individuals and special interest groups. The court wrote that the Federal Election Campaign Act's contribution and expenditure limits operate in an area of the most fundamental First Amendment activities. What First Amendment activities would the court have been talking about? Speech. Speech. Yes, I'm, just one moment. I want to show you something here. Now, you may have seen one of these. Yeah. This, I don't know about you, but this to me does not look like speech. This looks more like property to me. But here's the deal. Here's what the court said. That here is the part of the First Amendment. It says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And the court said that all of these limitations on spending, of, on contributing, are somehow abridging freedom of speech. That was the point. Effectively saying that money is the same as speech. What? What's going on here? Effectively, the Kelly hearing, the money is the same as speech and cannot be regulated. Uh, yeah. If you put that together with the Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, we have corporations have the same rights as people. Among them are freedom of speech, 
and money is the same as speech. Now that's where we got to by 1976. There are other, there's other legislation and other court cases, but these are the two big guys. Now I want to bring this forward to something you probably have heard of, and that is the Citizens United case. Have you heard of that? Yes. No? Well, I'll give you a little bit of background on it. There's a not-for-profit organization called Citizens United, and they really did not like, still do not like, Hillary Clinton. And she was running for, in the Democratic primary for president in the 2008 election cycle. And they wanted to stop her. So they put together what they call the documentary. It was basically just a hatchet job. And they wanted to show that right before each of the primaries. And should they, should they fail to stop her then, they wanted to show it in front of the general election as well. Well, one of the provisions of the McCain-Feingold Act was that there could be no electioneering, I promise you we use that word, no electioneering within 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election. But they wanted to show that documentary of theirs immediately prior to each of the, the uh, primaries to stop Hillary Clinton. So they filed suit so that they could, uh, challenging the legitimacy of that provision of McCain-Feingold, and they lost at the uh, the, uh, uh, the the first level, they lost at the appellate court. In fact, the uh, uh, the appeals court found that the movie was not a documentary. It was just a thirty second, uh, a thirty minute attempt to do a hatchet job on her. It was effectively a thirty second negative campaign uh, commercial stretched out to thirty minutes. That's all it was. And no, you can't do that because McCain Fine Pool prohibits it. Well. Citizens United didn't stop there. They appealed to the Supreme Court. Now, all this took place 2008-2009. They brought it to the Supreme Court, and the case was heard at the Supreme Court in 2009. The Supreme Court heard the case and decided in favor of Citizens United, largely saying prohibiting that electioneering was abridging free speech. And Citizens United is a corporation, so corporations have the same right as people. That was the decision. That should have been the end of it. Go ahead, they can show their documentary, but that was not the end of it. This is where this gets bizarre. Because after that, Chief Justice John Roberts caused the attorneys to come back and relitigate this case on a completely different basis. He said, come back and test the rights of corporations and speech equivalency, as in speech equivalency to money. He caused them to come back to re-litigate on that basis. Now bear in mind, Citizens United uh, was only looking to air their documentary. But instead, the Chief Justice caused them to come back and re-litigate. To say this is unusual grossly understates the case. This never happens, that a Chief Justice would do this, would expand a case like this. And indeed, they came back, and guess what? The case was decided in favor of Citizens United again, in spite of the fact that Citizens United had no interest in that part of this case. They Effectively, the Chief Justice caused the Supreme Court to litigate from the bench. It's an impeachable offense. Perhaps so. I don't know about that. The court found that the First Amendment does not allow prohibitions of speech based on the identity of the speaker, whether the speaker is a human being or a corporation. That's what they found. And it gets crazier than this. Stay with me on this. Just as Anthony Kennedy wrote most of the majority opinion, look at this. He said, if the First Amendment has any force, it prohibits Congress from fighting or jailing citizens or associations of citizens for simply engaging in political speech. That's what he said. Fining or jailing. Did you see anywhere in that Citizens United case where anyone was being fined or threatened with jail time? It had nothing to do with that. But that's what Justice Perfect. Kennedy wrote in the majority opinion. That effectively declared that corporations have the same rights of people. This is, this is, is uh, setting this in stone, that corporations have the same rights as people. This is taking that crazy head note from J.C. Bancroft Davis and enshrining it in our Supreme Court decisions. And this has unbelievable consequences to you and me. I'll show you that in just a moment, but I want you to hear a few more words from the justices in this case. For all that to be true, all of what Kennedy wrote 
Corporations have the same rights as natural persons. That is to say, the 14th Amendment, equal protection and due process clauses. They have all of that and more. In addition, that would come as a big surprise to the Congress of 1868, whose intention had nothing to do with giving rights to corporations. Furthermore, for Justice Kennedy's words to make any sense, you have to believe that money is equivalent to speech. It's the same thing. Money, the movie, speech, all the same thing. Now, that's that 14th Amendment that I show you, showed you before. You notice that it says citizens, person, person. It doesn't say anything about corporations. This is about human beings. So effectively, here is what the Supreme Court did in its Citizens United decision in 2010. It added this paragraph. All of the foregoing shall apply equally and without limit to any corporation, institution of any kind, and to any inanimate object. That's effectively what the Supreme Court said. So if perhaps somebody you know, a grandchild, something like that, has a little R2-D2 toy, the R2-D2 has the same rights you do. So it's really as crazy as this, but that's what got set up in that 1868 case. So let me show you some dissenting comments. Justice Stevens wrote the majority of the dissent, and he was livid over this dissent. He was just cross-eyed. He was so angry about it. He said, in Justice Stevens' dissent, he wrote that the court's ruling, this is a quote, threatens to undermine the integrity of elected institutions across the nation. How do you feel about the integrity of our elected institutions like, say, Congress? Boo. Boo, boo. Congress is held in esteem by about 19% of Americans. That's the high mark. Wonderful. It's been as low as 7% in the last few years. Second? It's 5% now. 5% now. And 95 wonderful. out of 100 people hold Congress in very low esteem. This is one of the reasons. What is it? I'm sure he did. Uh, now look at the rest of this. The path the majority has taken to reach its outcome will, I fear, do damage to this institution. Did you know that just a few years ago the Supreme Court was, was held in highest esteem of any profession in the United States? Americans saw Supreme Court justices as being the most lofty, and it ain't so anymore. Justice Stevens is right. Our confidence in our Supreme Court has plummeted as well. And I'm going to show you this a graph of trust. Pew Research did an interesting study on that very thing. He said a democracy cannot function effectively when its constituent members have laws that are being bought and sold. Do you believe laws are being bought and sold? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What does that do to your trust in government when you believe that? I think Justice Stevens was right. He's right. Laws like this undermine our confidence, our trust, our belief, our sense of integrity in our own governmental institutions. In addressing an issue that was not raised by the litigants, that, that business of having the litigants come back and re-litigate on things that were not part of the case, Justice Stevens says the majority changed the case to give themselves an opportunity to change the law. It's the very thing that so many people complain about with the Supreme Court litigating from the bench. Litigating is supposed to come from, the laws are supposed to come from the legislature, right? And they complain when the Supreme Court, in their view, creates its own new laws. Well, that's exactly what the Supreme Court did here. And it was really a blatant abuse of judicial power. Do you remember those limitations that I showed you before? All of these acts, all of this legislation was designed to prevent big money influence in politics, and with that one ruling, Citizens United wiped out every one of them. Wiped out every one of them. Let me show you how we Americans felt about this when it happened. A month after Citizens United decision, ABC News and the Washington Post took a poll on how Americans felt about the Citizens United decision. 86% of Democrats want to reverse. 81% of independents want to reverse, and 76% of Republicans want to reverse. We didn't like it. Roughly 80% of Americans, four out of five, said, that's bad for America, that's bad for us. And that number, by the way, has gone up since then. We tend to have a short memory, but when people know about Citizens United, 
it's now up to nine out of ten of us want it changed. Here it is, 90%. This is a this is a study that was done uh, in October of 2012. We're at 90% now. Nine out of ten of us say that was really bad for America. I want it reversed. Maybe you think, ah, the righties like it, business types like it, right? Businessmen like that Citizens United thing, right? Here's a study that, that was done by, uh, um, yeah, the Lake Research did this study. This was uh, in 2012. Two out of three small businessmen think that Citizens United was wrong. They want to reverse it. They think 80% 80, 80 of them think it's bad for business. Isn't that interesting? They think it's bad for business. This is pretty much universally uh, a universally held belief. We don't like this. It's bad for us. Justice Stevens wrote that even if the exchange for votes and expenditures, that is to say contributions, could not be shown, he said contributors gain favorable political access from such expenditures. Do you think that the high rollers, the big money contributors, <coughs> gain favorable access to our legislations, legislators? You think? Yeah. Hold on to your, hold, hold on to your hat. From the uh, Woodrow Wilson School, they did a study on money influence on our senators. In almost every instance, senators appear to be considerably more responsive to the opinions of affluent constituents. How about that? than to the opinions of middle class constituents, while the opinions of constituents in the bottom third of the income distribution have no apparent effect on the senator's roll call votes. Big money people get listened to, small money people don't. That's what they found. And it stands to reason, doesn't it? Have you seen Robert Reich's film, Inequality for All? Have you seen that? I want to show you just a short clip from that movie. Here we go. When so many resources, so much money, so much wealth, so much income accumulates at the very top, that with money comes the capacity to control politics. Sinister way it starts. Usually they bring in somebody you haven't seen for a few years. You know they're paying them 10 grand. Might be the best man in your wedding or a guy you played football with. You say, Eddie, hell, I haven't seen you. And then they say, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, old Freckles here. And then they give you the whole load. But money, I mean, did the lobbyists come in? And obviously the unspoken reality is. We can help you in your next election if you cooperate with us. There's a guy in every office to say so-and-so wants to see you. He's from the American Shoe Leather Company. They have maxed out, meaning they gave you the maximum in your primary when you first started. They gave you the maximum in every general. You've run three times now, and they were there for you at every point. And what for? Access. What, what, what did he say? Access. This, you, you remember Alan Simpson, right? Yeah. He was, he was like, a, like a bedrock kind of guy in the Senate for the longest time. And I think, what did he say? Oh, yeah, access. That's what he said. That money buys access. You want to talk to your congressman or senator? Good luck if you haven't made big campaign contributions. Because that's what they need. They need big campaign contributions. And I'm going to give you an idea of the kind of, kind of money that they need in order to get into office and to stay in office. Here's a piece from uh, Tom Friedman wrote a year and a half ago. He said, in order to get and stay elected today, you have to raise huge sums of money from corporations, wealthy individuals, and dues-laden unions. And that's because of television advertising cost. It is horrendously, obscenely expensive. And yet it's necessary in our system today if you want to get elected and stay elected. That's the problem. He further wrote that all this money leads to twisted decision-making on the high politics level. And I'm going to give you some examples of twisted decision-making. And regulatory capture at the bureaucratic administrative level. I told you a moment ago that we're being affected by this, and the Pew Research did a study on our trust in government. Here's a graph from 1960 to the end of 1913. We were up in the high 70% of trust in our government 
back in the uh, uh, Eisenhower era and into the Kennedy era. Now we're at 19 percent. That's stuck about stuck right around 19 percent for about the last year. That is to say, four out of five Americans don't trust our government. Charles. Gallup did a, a, a poll covering the same period of time that came up with exactly the same numbers. Consistently, four out, of, uh, four out of five of us don't trust our government, and that's a problem if we're going to have a democracy. Okay. It comes down to that. I told you, I would tell you how you're being affected by this. I mean, you personally. Because this isn't some esoteric notion out there. This is affecting you. That, that's a Bushmaster assault rifle. I bet you've heard of those. That's the model that that crazy guy used at Sandy Hook Elementary School to sick, kill 20 little kids and seven teachers. That's what he used, and he had no trouble getting his hands on it. After Sandy Hook, 80% of us, once again, four out of five of us, wanted universal background checks on guns. 40% of all firearm sales are do, I have no background check associated with them. It's, it's the gun show loophole and other methodology that people use to get around background checks, which means that any wacko could get his or her hands on a firearm. Now, if four out of five Americans wanted universal background checks, arguably, probably, four out of five of us in this room did as well, somewhere in that vicinity, but then we did not get our way, and in fact, it never came up for a vote. It was prevented from coming to a vote by a procedural sleight of hand in the Senate. So it was never voted on. Now why would that be? Why wouldn't our senators want to vote to support what you and I want? Well, it's because of the NRA. They spent over 12 million dollars in the last election cycle, Mo almost all of it donated to, uh, to uh, candidates for office. 12 million dollars. And when that universal background check legislation was being attempted to be brought through Congress, representatives from the National Rifle Association went around and talked to every senator and every congressman and scared the hell out of them. They said, you know that money that we gave to you in the last election cycle? If you vote for this legislation for universal background checks, not only will we not give you money for your next campaign, we will give that money to your opponent. You're going to lose your job. And that is why you didn't get universal background checks on firearms. That is why there's no ban on assault rifles. Let's try another, another way you might be affected. Do you care about energy? Do you care about the climate? No. Do we have a climate control policy in this country? No. No, we don't. Now, why is that? 97% of climatologists say the Earth is warming and it is being warmed at a much faster rate because of what human beings do, largely burning fossil fuels. That's what they tell us, and yet we're doing nothing about it. I wonder if you care about that. I wonder if you would care if your kitchen faucet could be lit on fire, as some people can, where there's been fracking done and methane is leaking into the groundwater. I wonder if you'd care if... Say, you know one of those 11 men who were lost in the BP Deepwater Horizon well. They will never be found. They put over 4 million gallons of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico and then compounded that pollution by dumping 250,000 gallons of toxic, mutagenic, possibly carcinogenic dispersant on the four, those 4 million gallons. And they did that because they could disperse it and put it out of sight. You can't see it anymore. There isn't an oil slick that you can see. It's out of sight. But I assure you, it's all still there. It's out of sight, out of mind, but that doesn't mean the pollution and the adverse effects are gone. And they have some funky looking fish washing up on the shore there. So, next shrimp cocktail from the Gulf of Mexico that you enjoy, bon appetit. Maybe you care about the tons of carbon dioxide we're dumping into the air with our coal-fired coal -fired, uh, power plants. I do. It matters to me, and it's going to matter to our children and grandchildren even more. How come we're not doing anything about it? I want to give you some statistics on what big energy has done to prevent anything from happening, anything from getting better. In 2011, hmm, 
They spent $146 million lobbying Congress. That's a quarter of a million dollars for every one of our people in Congress. That was in one year, a quarter of a million dollars spent lobbying. That was just big energy. They made an average of $40,000 of donation per senator. If you were one of those senators and you were in a tough race, that 40000 bucks would matter to you, and you just might feel beholden to the good people who gave you that money. And that is what happens. Why don't we have any legislation to control global warming? Well, they spent $543 million to kill the climate bill. That's why. Oh, and by the way, while we were doing that, we gave them $4.4 billion in subsidies. Now, that's how we, and that, and it's legal. It's legal because we have legislators who made those laws to make that happen. And you got to wonder, now, why would they pass laws like that? Anybody here care about health care? I'll bet you do. I'll bet you do. Let me. Maybe you care about premature babies. Maybe you care about just old guys sitting on a park bench. Anybody here, anybody here ever do that? Any old guys here sitting on a park bench? <laughs> maybe you care about just ordinary American families and our health care. I want to talk about one piece of our health care and why it isn't getting better with any, any uh, speed. I want to talk about Big Pharma, and specifically Big Pharma, I want to talk about just the meds portion. Not hospitals, not doctors, I'm talking about pills and the like. They make up one-third of our medical spend every year. It is 6% of our gross domestic product. It is huge, huge money that we spend. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about that, because I want you to understand what's happened with it. I also want you to know that Big Pharma has spent $390 per second fighting Obamacare. They're still spending that money. Now, you recognize that guy, Billy Tawson? Yes. Billy Tawson was a congressman from Louisiana. He was a longtime congressman. He left Congress the same time George W. Bush left the, the White House. He was at the end, Tawson was at the, the end of his time in Congress. And you may remember that Medicare Part D was making its way through Congress back then. Just before the vote, Billy Tawson tossed in an amendment. The amendment said that the United States government, the largest purchaser of medic meds in the world, the United States government was specifically prohibited from negotiating pricing with Big Pharma. No value discounts for us. That's what it said. And it made its way through Congress. Now, let me just offer one other thing about Billy Towson, because he did leave Congress in January of, of uh, 2009. Billy Towson immediately got hired by PHRMA. That is the lobbying group for Big Pharma. Isn't that an interesting move? An interesting move? And he got a 7,000% increase in his pay instantly. Wow. That's impressive, huh? Billy Tawson cashed out big time. <laughs> now, I can't tell you that's a quid pro quo, but you can make up your own mind. Those are the facts. Let me hit on one other piece of health care, because I want you to get this as affecting you. It, it, this is from a study on se of health outcomes in 17 industrialized high-income countries among which is the United States of America. And if you're an American male, you will live 3.7 fewer years than your Swiss counterpart. A person exactly like you in Switzerland will live 3.7 years longer. Are you a woman? You are going to live 5.7 fewer years than your Japanese counterpart. And I'm talking about with life circumstances, same thing. That's what they found. Our healthcare system isn't keeping you alive the way others are being kept alive. How about this? We have the highest rate of infant mortality of 17 countries. We are killing our babies at an unprecedented rate. We have the second highest prevalence of HIV and uh, the highest incidence of AIDS, and we have the second highest death rate from ischemic heart disease. Now that's how we're doing with our health care system here, and there is gigantic resistance to changing that because there's a lot of money in it. The companies providing health care, meds, equipment, are making huge money. They don't want to see it changed, in spite of the fact that you're going to die younger than you need to. Need to. And oh, by the way, while all this is going on, we are paying a minimum of double what all those other countries are paying. A minimum. Like I said, you may care about this 
business about big money influence in our Congress, in our politics. You are being affected by this. Let me show you one other piece, because I want to show you what's really causing all of this. Because they aren't all bums in Congress. I'm telling you right now, there's some very good people there. Here's the problem. That's the W. Edwards Benning. He's the guy who went to Japan following World War II and taught quality to the Japanese. In the late 40s and early 50s, made in Japan meant it was junk. But I bet you don't feel that way about your Sony TV or your Lexus automobile and so many other things made in Japan. He taught the Japanese quality. It was highly successful. He had his 14 principles. Now I'm going to show you one of those principles. Here's what he said. When there is a problem, look to the system for the cause, not the individual. Nobody comes to work saying, let's see how I can do a bad job today. Nobody. But a lot of people come to work wanting to do a good job, but they don't do a good job because they are locked into a system that is made for failure. And that is exactly what's going on in our politics today. We have a system, a system of funding our elections that requires huge money in order for somebody to get elected and stay in office. The result of that is candidates are compromised by the need for big money. Good people do stupid stuff because they have to or they won't be there. I want to talk about the 2012 Iowa caucuses. I want to show you how much money is being spent, what it takes to get elected. The Iowa caucuses, there are fewer people in all of Iowa than in the six county metropolitan area of Chicago. Do you know that? It's not, it's not, it's like six and a half million people in Iowa. Rick Santorum was leading in the polls there, leading up to the Iowa caucuses. Rick Santorum spent $303,000 in Iowa. And if you do the simple math by, uh, relative to the number of votes he got, he spent 10 bucks a vote. You may remember that Mitt Romney also was involved in the Iowa caucuses. And he carpet bombed the Iowa airwaves with negative ads against Santorum for the three weeks immediately prior to the Iowa caucuses. He spent $2.3 million in Iowa. $2 million more than Santorum. He spent 75 bucks a vote. And guess what? He eked out a victory. He beat Santorum. Not by much, but he beat him. That'll give you an idea of... Well, yeah, it, there was a recount, and then Santorum got it. Yeah. Right, I understand. But he closed that gap, and he got on the radar of a lot of people. It was pretty successful. I want to talk about the general election. Let's ramp this up. I want you to see the kind of money that it takes to get and stay elected. In the 2012 general election, the presidential contest cost over $2 billion. $2 billion. I'm not talking about primaries. I'm talking about just the general election. $2 billion. If you add in all the money for all of the other seats, it was $10 billion total. Now I want you to get that that's double the amount that was spent just four years earlier in 2008. What would have caused that spend to go up so much in just four years, one election cycle? What do you think? Citizens United is what happened. Citizens United, it unlocked the floodgates of big money in our politics. That happened in 2010, presto, change it, we double the spend. That is, that is double, eight times what we spent a generation ago. The Nixon-Kennedy election was the first televised election, right? The first televised election, 1960. They spent $14 million, that's $109 million in today's dollars. Look at that. In that short period of time, we went from $109 million to $2.1 billion to be elected president. It's horrendously expensive. If you want to get elected and stay elected, you need a whole lot of money. And you can't do it with $3 contributions. It cannot be done. You need the big money contributions. And you need help beyond that, in fact. You need help from outside organizations like Super PACs. Super PACs are just one kind of third-party organization. I'm going to talk about them because the, they're the big money. Super PACs. Here the, here's the deal with Super PACs. Anybody can contribute to them. And you may remain anonymous. That is to say, it's dark money. Nobody knows where it came from. In addition, Super PACs can engage in unlimited spending as long as it's independent of, the, of a candidate's campaign. That turns out to be a little wink-wink. Trust me when I tell you, they are coordinated. They don't sit down and plan the strategy, but 
if you take a look at who's on which payroll, there's a lot of conversation that goes on. And they may not make contributions directly to a candidate's campaign or to political parties. Other than that, super PACs can do what they want, and they do a lot. They do a lot of negative TV advertising. You know why they do a lot of negative TV advertising? It works. It works. Because it works. Because you and I are watching. That's why. You and I are watching. They've, super PACs have outspent all other types of spending groups, and it's nearly all on negative TV advertising. <laughs> This is, uh, have, you read, uh, have you read John Nichols' book, Dollarocracy? Well, here's a plug for John Nichols' book, Dollarocracy. It will explain to you all of the gigantic need for money and why it doesn't change. Andy, where's Andy? You were talking about uh, the media before when you were making your announcements. The media doesn't cover certain things. That is to say, the corporate media doesn't. You know why? They don't want to bite the hand that feeds them during the election cycle. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's like Butler. <laughs> let me let me just show you a little bit. This is this is uh, an interim graph. This was by uh, August of 2012, in advance of the 2012 election. This is TV ad funding. That big orange piece of that pie that's a third of the spend. That's Carl Rove's Crossroads GPS Super PAC. Now, that alone isn't all that alarming. Here's what is alarming, where the money came from. 90% of the donations to his organization were from just 24 billionaires. 24 people are controlling or dramatically influencing our election. This is what's going on. Let's try this one. This is Super PAC individual donors. You see that blue piece? That's Sheldon Adelson and his wife. Now, they spent a lot of money in the 2000 election uh, cycle. Did you know that every candidate they backed lost? Every single candidate lost. And didn't matter, Shelley Adelson was still going around the, uh, the, the uh, halls of Congress doing a victory lap and smiling. Now, why would he do that? Look at his wife. <laughs> no, I, it had nothing to do with his wife. It had everything to do with two of these $150 million spend. There's nothing that Sheldon Adelson dislikes more than unions. He abhors unions. And in the state of Michigan, there was a proposal to, it, it would have enshrined the right to collective bargaining in the laws of Michigan. Now, can you imagine that? They had to even put that referendum on the ballot. But it was there, and Shelley Abelson spent $2 million to defeat it. And he won. The proper proposal went down. He didn't care about the other $148 million that didn't get his candidates elected. He got the biggest thing that he wanted. He has the only casino on the Las Vegas Strip that's non-union. This is a guy who doesn't like unions, and if he defeated unions, he's a happy camper. So I want you to get big money influences more than who gets elected. It influences more than our laws. It influences a lot. In a moment, I'm going to show you how it influences all the way through our judicial branch of government. You remember the A.T. Massey Coal Company, a division of Massey Energy? You may remember that one of their mines in West Virginia collapsed in 2010, and 29 miners died. Well, in advance of that, there was something else that took place that is really, really telling. There was a lawsuit against Massey, and Massey lost, and there was a $50 million award to plaintiffs from that case. Now, CEO Don Blankenship didn't like that very much, and he caused $3 million to be sent, uh, um, spent to unseat a judge. They elect their Supreme Court justices in West Virginia. He spent $3 million to unseat a guy who had been there for a while. He put up his candidate. His candidate was Brent Benjamin. And guess what? Benjamin won the election. $3 million goes a long way in advertising in West Virginia. And Benjamin won. Now, the appeal to that $50 million award went to the Supreme Court after Benjamin got on the bench. Interestingly enough, Blankenship won that case 3-2. to two. Huh. What do you suppose the connectivity is of that? 
I wonder how qualified Benjamin was for that position. Here's an interesting little factoid. He graduated from law school four weeks before he was elected to the Supreme Court <laughs> in West Virginia. But three million dollars goes a long way, and Don Blankenship got what he wants. Big money buys whatever it can. And I'll tell you what, if you were one of the plaintiffs in this case, you wouldn't have liked this process very much. And I assure you that those people didn't either. Influence. You know what, K Street? K Street is where, where so many lobbyists have their offices in D.C. What percentage of American major American corporations pay income tax? What do you think? Give me a number. Zero. Zero? We got a lot of cynics. It's not that bad. It's actually 25%. One out of four actually pays income taxes. The other three do not. And that's taking money out of your pocket. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. One... These are, these are, we're talking about outfits like this, Exxon, Bank of America, GE, and Wells Fargo. Another question for you. Our corporate income tax rate, you may know that the high, top rate for corporate income taxes is 39%. What's the effective rate that corporations pay? 20%. 12.6%. 12 12.6%. 12 you know all the whining and the crying about we can't be globally competitive because our tax rates are so high? Utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. But it's a real good line for getting people you want elected. Get everybody, get all the blue collar workers all worked up. My job's going overseas because our corporate tax rates are too high. And you get votes. And you, people like you and I, we wind up voting against our own interests then. See that? That's a building in, on Grand Cayman Island. The way they get away with an awful lot of the uh, tax avoidance is by hiding money offshore. So, so they get away with that because the IRS regulations allow for that. There's only one reason the IRS regulations allow for that. Our legislators pass laws that make this kind of stuff possible. And the big money buys those kind of law, that kind of laws. I want to play just a little bit with GE a little bit. In 2010, they had $12 billion in profit. How much income tax did they pay? Zero. Zero. Absolutely zero. Look at this. They got over $3 billion in federal tax refunds between 2008 and 2012. And during that period, they racked in $27 billion in profit. Not sales, profit. Now, how come they could get away with that? The IRS regulations allow for it. That's why. Let's go back to this. How about Bank of America? Hmm. Bank of America. They have over 300 offshore dummy corporations and they're hiding $17 billion in profit and not paying any tax on it. They paid $2.7 billion to, to settle a Department of Justice lawsuit largely around fraudulent foreclosures. Maybe you remember that. A lot of fraudulent foreclosures. And we made them pay. $2.7 billion, which turns out to be a joke in terms of the amount of money it is relative to the size of Bank of America, but the story gets even uglier because they wrote it off. They, they wrote off that settlement amount and, it, and they saved a billion dollars in tax. You know why they did that? Because they could. The IRS regulations allow for that kind of stuff. Big money, the big money of all of these corporations is buying influence that gets the laws that favor them. Who do you suppose covers the cost? I mean, our government costs a certain amount of money to run. If they're not paying their taxes, who do you think is paying it? You are. This is costing you money. U.S. Perk did a study. They called it representation without taxation. Like that? That's pretty good. And they came up with what they, what they called their Dirty 30. Now that's the chart. I know you can't read it, so I've blown it up because I want you to see a certain part of that. They just picked off of 30 corporations that are spending a lot of money lobbying and, in consequence, paying yes. no taxes. Now I've just got the headings here. I got rid of the rest so I could blow this up so you could see it. Those 30 corporations had $163 billion in profit. $163 billion in profit. In federal income taxes, they paid minus $10 billion. That is to say, they were $10 billion of 
refunds going to this corpor these corporations that made all that money. That's an effective tax rate of minus 6.5%. Show of hands of everybody who has a minus 6% tax rate. Yeah, right. No, there's not any hands. Of course not. And they got tax subsidies of $67 billion, like that 4.4 that we give to big oil every year. And all they had to do is spend $475 million in lobbying expense mm. to get all that. That's a pretty good return on investment, yeah. isn't it? You're spending that kind of money and getting that kind of return, right? No, you're not. <laughs> Let me show you. I'm going to give you the dollars that this costs you. Well. That takes $473 out of your pocket every year. You marry? Your spouse pays the same, another 473 That's what it costs when our big corporations are getting away with this stuff. All because the IRS regulations allow for it. Let, let's just summarize this. 90% of Americans want universal background checks on guns. 81% of NRA members want that. Between 64 and 80% of Americans want Citizens United reversed. A majority of Americans support immigration reform and proper funding for veterans' care. Almost all Americans want corporate loopholes and special corporate tax treatments ended. Awesome. Every one of those things has been blocked in Congress. You're not getting what you want. So that's what we have now. That's what's going on. It's all due to big money influence in Congress. And oh, by the way, the story gets worse. <laughs> have you heard about the McCutcheon case? Yes. That's Sean McCutcheon. He's a brilliant businessman man in Birmingham, Alabama. And McCutcheon doesn't like having limitations on what he can contribute to political campaigns. Now currently, the limitation is $2,600 per candidate per election with an aggregate total of $123,000 in any one election. That's not enough for Sean McCutcheon. He wants to be able to buy his own senator. Right. So he filed suit, and it was that case was heard by the Supreme Court in October last year. He wants, yeah, Alabama, Birmingham. He wants... All the, all the stops lifted so he can contribute anything you want. You want to see big money influence in our politics go just skyrocket. Just fear for your life if the Supreme Court decision comes down in favor of McCutcheon. We're expecting a decision anytime between now and June. Okay, what are we going to do about it? How do we move forward? We've got to do something about this because you and I and everyone we know is being hurt by this. My pal Dan Wartenberg likes to say we are perfectly positioned to get exactly the results we're getting right now. Is Dan right? Yes. Thank you. Dan is right. If we want something different, if we want something better, we're going to have to change what we're doing. You and I are going to have to change what we're doing. Yes. Back to the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. It seems to me we're going to have to do something about limiting expenditures if we're going to do anything about this. So let me ask you something. Can we abridge free speech? Well, you can't slander or libel another person. We've decided that being dishonest about another person is worse than limiting your ability to do that. So yeah, we curtail your ability to do that sort of thing. No, you don't have free speech. You can't say those things. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater because we have as a society decided that our collective safety is more important than any one person's right to say whatever they want, whenever they want to say it. I live in Northbrook. We have an ordinance in Northbrook. One political sign per registered voter in the House, per candidate or issue, to a maximum of two signs. That's it, because we've decided, you know what? We really don't want our ones looking like Sanford and Son. <laughs> <laughs> and so my, my right of free speech is abridged. I cannot put a forest of political signs on my lawn. It's as simple as that. And I can't put any on the parkway in front of my house. That's how it works. We've agreed we can regulate speech. We've always been able to regulate speech. And yet somehow we don't seem to be able to do it in the political arena. But we're going to have to do it if something's going to get better. Whoop. Watch this video. Oh, that's not good. Oh, I don't mean 
this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. You need a fork, don't you? Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Yeah. What? Help! Help! <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> well, it's not enough left to do, is it? Nope. Nothing else left to do than cry. That's right. Walk up the escalator. That's all there is. Well, that's the point, isn't it? Sometimes we make ourselves helpless. We human beings do that. We just look at our circumstances and say, oh, there's nothing I can do about this. Right. But sometimes the solution is right in front of us. Like for these people, it's a stairway, not an escalator. Go up the stairs. It's the same for us. The solution is right in front of us. It comes out this way. Passing a law will not fix this problem. Because any law that we, that we pass will, will be in conflict with a Supreme Court decision. That is to say, to change this, it's going to require an amendment to the Constitution. That's the only way it can, it can be done. And here's the deal about amendments to the Constitution. Our Constitution provides for two ways to do that. One is to hold a constitutional convention. That's not going to happen. Forget it. The other is by passage with a two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress, and then within seven years, passage by three-quarters of the states. That's 37. That's tough work. That's a tough haul. That's really difficult. And it's been done 27 times. It's doable. We can do it. And it's up to us to do that, or we will continue to get more and more of what we've been getting. Question for you. What's your vision for America? There what? is none. There Marxism. is no America. Well, all right. That's... That went down the toilet years ago. Okay. And on that hopeful note... There's no more America. Killing. What's your vision for America? What do you want to see America? What is the America you believe in? Let me ask it in a far more visceral way. What's the Amer your vision for America for your children and your grandchildren? A woman president. What? The America of John D. Rockefeller. Listen, you have a vision of what you want to see America look like. And it's not just for you. We are crafting an America that we are going to hand to our children and grandchildren. And if what we're getting right now is not what you want, we're going to have to do something about it. What are you willing to do to ensure that the America you believe in, the America you, their American vision you have, is what they get? Because it is up to us. Let me show you this. This is from an address of President Obama to the Israeli people last year. He said, political leaders will never take risks if the people do not push them to take some risks. You think that's true? Yes. Yes, political leaders play it safe because they're always covering their own fannies. You must create the change you want to see. Ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things. It's up to us to do that very thing. Look, here's what you can do. You can be interested. You can continue to be informed. It's critically important. And in fact, this was laid out at the founding of this nation by Thomas Jefferson. Here's what he said. He said, an enlightened citizenry is indispensable for the proper functioning of a republic. Self-government is not possible unless the citizens are educated sufficiently to enable them to exercise oversight. Did you think your civic duty was done when you walked out of the polling booth? It wasn't. It wasn't. Our job is to exercise oversight all the time. You want accountability? We have to demand accountability. Here's the second thing you can do. Be active. Be part of the, be part of the uh, solution. In fact, I just happen to have a little flyer, if you'd like to take one and pass it on. This is for Move to Amend Chicago, Chicago North. That'll wake up again in a moment. And I would encourage you to take a look at that. If you live in the city, there's a Move to Amend chapter right here. And I'd encourage you to get involved, show up. Now that's just one of the organizations that's working hard to, to, to make a difference in this to cause us to have a 
constitutional amendment that will fix this problem. Let's see if we can get this guy to turn back on again. There's a couple more things I want to show you. It'll cycle back on in a second. In terms of being active, let me offer you the words of Thomas Paine. Do you remember Thomas Paine? <laughs> remember that guy? These are the times that try men's souls. You know, outside peasantator. These are the times that try men's souls. He wrote that in 1776, the winter of 1776, 1777. Let me ask you something. Do these times try your soul? Yes. Yeah, well, see, it turns out that not much has changed in the intervening years. Come on, I know you can do it. <laughs> Here we go. Let's give this just a moment. Oh, all right. We're going to have some out over there. All right. He said, the summer soldier and the sunshine, <coughs> sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his company, country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. It's time for us to stand by America. Because if we don't, no one else will. And you're gonna, we're going to get an America that we don't want. And so are our children, so are our grandchildren. I want you to see this. This is a referendum passed by the Oregon State Legislature. Look at this. Money is property and not speech. And the Congress of the United States State Legislatures and local legislative bodies <coughs> should have the authority to regulate political contributions and expenditures. That was passed last year, and that was sent to Congress saying, this is what the people of Oregon want. Isn't that interesting? It's not binding. It doesn't make the Congress do anything. But we've got to have the force of the weight of millions of people saying, what we have now isn't OK. We need to get this changed. Sixteen other states have passed similar resolutions, including Illinois. We did this, did this last year. There were hundreds of proposed ballot initiatives in the 2012 election cycle. Hundreds of them in cities and states. And every one of them passed. Isn't that interesting? Every one of them passed by a minimum of 64%. A minimum. We had, Terry, was it five townships or, in Illinois? Yeah, but Oak Park was 84, 85.4. All right. Oak Park was 85.4. I live in Northfield Township. It was something somewhere along those, uh, something, somewhere around that number as well. Every ballot initiative, every referendum passed. We got them. Because that's what people want. So, I will, here's something I want you to get about this. This is what Republicans, Democrats, no-name Americans, independents, it's what we all want. Four out of five of us want this, a minimum of four out of five of us. One more clip. You, you remember Star Wars? Yeah. How about the movie The Empire Strikes Back? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Watch this. <laughs> We're coming out of the asteroid field. Let's get out of here. Ready for light speed? Children say it all the time, right? And it's not useful to say those things. It's just not useful. It doesn't get anything done. Here's what I want you to get about this. We have to make our voices heard, and here's why. If you don't make your voice heard, people who want a very different America from the one that you want will make their voices heard, because they'll be the only ones talking. <laughs> That means we have to raise our voices. We have to be heard, like with those ballot initiatives. 
Remember your, remember your grade school, high school science class? Remember Isaac Newton? Remember him? He had his laws of motion. Here's one of them. A body in motion will tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. That means that the downward spiral, or spiral we're on with regard to big money in our politics, it's going to continue to get worse unless acted upon by an outside force. That means you and me. That's what it's going to take. One last clip. Everybody in this room is old enough to remember this well. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you Ask what you can do for your country. This half a century later, that still stirs my soul, but maybe it does you. Mm -hmm. There is something we can do about this, and it's up to us to do it. Ask what you can do for your country, and our country needs us right now. You're welcome. You wrap it up. Yeah, I'm at the end. I'm at the end. Simple, easy steps you can take. One, talk about this. Educate people. Four out of five who know about this craziness want it changed. The trick is getting more people to know about it. That's why I'm here tonight. That's why I do these talks. It's for the purpose of education, and I'm hoping that what I'm saying here will sing for you, will ring true for you, and cause you to want to pick yourself up and do something with this. Because sitting on that barca lounger is not going to happen. Here's number two. Sign When there's a ballot refer referendum in front of you, sign it. Sign the petition. Help it out. And vote. We've got an election coming up in November. Do you know what the, what the typical midterm election turnout is? Two out of three people who are eligible to vote don't show up. And most of these contests are won by a percentage point or two, which is to say about 15 or 16 percent of the voters are deciding everything for all of us. Your vote counts. It matters. Get out on election day. There are things you can do. Your vote counts big time. Oh, by the way, you can subscribe to my blog. That's another thing you can do. I've got uh, some cards here that have the the address. Okay. Please take it, sign up. It's a once a week Sunday morning read. Look, here's the deal. There are a number of organizations working on this, and this is just some of them. And Terry, you're involved in the coalition, are you not? Say a couple of words about that so these folks know that there really are a lot of people vitally interested in this. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, their move to mend affiliates all over the United States, it's a growing movement. Uh, unfortunately, as the gentleman mentioned earlier, we are getting zero press regardless of how much we accomplish, and very few people actually know about us. But here in the Chicago area, uh, we're involved in a coalition that involves move to mend uh, affiliates uh, around the area. We have one in the north, uh, the near west suburbs uh, as well. But there are coalitions that include Common Cause, Illinois Purd, uh, Illinois Campaign uh, for uh, Election Reform, uh, Move On, it goes on and on. Uh, public Citizen, uh, uh, yes, several churches and uh, uh, unions and all sorts of people. People are involved and it's a growing movement and we have people joining us every uh, week almost. Terry, if, if anybody here is interested in learning more, would you be willing to talk with them after we're done? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't talk to you about this before. I right. kind of blindsided you with that. That's fine. We're going to really have to wrap it up because we got to go to questions and rebuttals. This isn't about righties or lefties, it's about America. America, it's up to us. Let me just... Look, we're really going to have to... I, Jim, my last slide. Last slide. All this patriotic we can stuff. do something about this. We can cure electile dysfunction. <laughs> Jim, where's Brown? I'll leave you the word to, with the words of a great political oh, okay. philosopher, Dr. Seuss. He said, if someone like you doesn't care a whole lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. It's up to us, and you do care. So thank you for your interest, your attention, and for being part of the solution.
Well, would I you, see the first question comes from Pat Lutz. Would you mind turning yeah. off your projector uh, so we can get a point, clear? Do what? Just turn off the projector. Sure. Thanks. You can trip on the court again. That'll work. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Thanks. Yes, sir. You uh, pointed out that uh, uh, the interpretation of the law is that corporations are still persons yeah. with all of the privileges and responsibilities as persons. No, sir. Rights as persons. It doesn't say anything about responsibilities. Same rights as persons. However, yeah. <coughs> since very often laws are carried to their logical conclusion, would it serve then that if they are persons, they are subject to, if they commit egregious offenses, uh, imprisonment or death? Yes. <laughs> yes, since we do have capital punishment in this uh, country, yes, that does make sense, and it's not happening. How, how, what's the number of, uh, of our, uh, uh, the bankers who went to jail? Zero. 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 After 2008. Yeah, zero. Zero. And there were some of them co blatantly committed fraud. What? One. One did. One did. One went to jail? Yeah. Oh, I didn't get off. Thank you. There. We learned something. He wasn't a Okay, one. Uh, so, so, of course, uh, OFA 100% behind you, and we have seen campaigns where we were, we were down 10 to 1 in terms of money. We had one time for money, but we had the boots on the ground, and we had people educated. So we agree with you 100%. My question to you is, who do you have to charge of social marketing? Do you use things like patch and get to the people faster? And also, do you use demography data so we can go towards our purple districts and move where I think we have high youth outreach, et cetera, because the youth feel very differently from the old. That's yes, right. My answer is I'm not that organized and need to get more organized. On the other hand, I am getting started uh, in, in the education field. I'm in the process of making arrangements for the College of Lake County to do a program for yeah. those students there. All right. But community uh, colleges be excellent outreach. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes. Don Ritchie. Okay. Um, now, you said earlier, now, Mr. Altshuler, you said earlier in your lecture that a constitutional amendment is the only way to bring about a change of the sort that you're seeking. Yes. Uh, and, and this is all an outgrowth of, of the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, uh, correct? So what your camp, this That's campaign. the most egregious okay. Thing, okay, uh, sure. piece of legislation. All right. Yes. What about, could, could the same kind of change not be affected by a Supreme Court that sees things differently and overturns the Citizens United decision in the same way that the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. My understanding is yes, that could happen. But it would take a court that would be willing to do, make that reversal. Okay. Then, so in that case, so in that case, the constitutional amendment isn't the only way to do it. The same thing could be accomplished by getting a president and senators elected to public office who would agree with us. The information I have suggests that that's not that, that really won't work. Terry, you have something you want to yeah, yeah. respond with on this? Technically, he's correct, but in practical terms, the court does not move with that rapidity in that process um, effectively. It would probably take maybe 40 years before you have a full reversal of that process, just to clarify. You think even, even want, just not to be controversial, but you think even if we have four now, even if we had a fifth justice who made sense, that wouldn't work. Okay. Yeah, not a full uh, turnover. I think should go through the chairs yeah. or moderator. Okay, let's. Yes, David. Uh, my question to you is this. Do you really think that with the Democrats at, at present holding a very slim margin in the Senate. What percentage is that? There were public in the Senate. You can get a constitutional amendment along the lines of giving a suggestion to the Congress. Could, could you hear the question? No. He it's, it's, wanted to do a reality check. Given a makeup of our Congress, the slim uh, uh, Democratic majority in, in the Senate and a Republican majority in the House. And they may lose the Senate. Too. They may lose the Senate. Is it realistic to suggest we could get an amendment through Congress? That's the, just a, the question. The answer is, given those demographics in Congress, probably not. But this is a long push. This is not the kind of thing we're going to accomplish in the next 10 months. This is going to take a longer time than that. So it's, it's a valid concern. It's going to take time. It's just going to take time. Bill Rest. I, I, I think you said 37 state legislatures oh, sure. to pass a constitutional amendment. Three quarters, and I think 37 is the number. Okay. 
it's, it's notorious that state legislatures are much cheaper to buy than the national legislature. When this becomes an actual amendment and, and not a, a statement of opinion, it will literally have all the big money in the world against it. What is your strategy to push the state legislatures uphill against all the money in the world? I don't have that that strategy. Please uh, let me know when, when yeah, you come up with that. And, and I don't know who does have that strategy, and that's a very, very big hill to climb. I completely agree with you, and yet it's one we must climb. We're going to have to figure it out. All right, Judy. The only egregious cases lately have not been just McCutcheon and Citizens United. There's also been Kilo, and there's about to be Hobby Lobby. So what do we do about these other decisions that slowly chip away at other rights and not just our electoral rights? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to do about it, and here's why. This big money influence in our politics really is the mother of all the dysfunction, mm -hmm. all of it. Whether it's Hobby Lobby or any of the others, it's big money influence that's causing that, allowing that to happen. So this is about going after the root cause. The others, as important as they are, I agree with you, uh, they are more symptoms of the actual disease. So that's why I'm focused on that. I hope that is, speaks to your question. Yeah, but the, the problem is, yes, the big money is the big problem, yeah. but if we get a bunch of Supreme Court decisions or otherwise that restrict our rights, we may end up with very restricted voting rights before we get a chance to pass such referenda as you're talking about. We're already getting restricted. Voting. I know, exactly I know. Right. I'm talking about places other than the red states. All right. I hear you. Are, are you, I'm just curious, are you sure money is not speech? Because I've always heard the phrase, money talks, bullshit walks. <laughs> Tim, I don't know how to respond to that. Bullshit doesn't get no places. Thank you. Yeah, on several occasions, you drag and rag about the problem is the money, the problem is the money. You may not even have one time mentioned the, the despicable, filthy, vile, wretched vermin that accepts the money. You don't seem to place any blame on the fact that the vast majority of men who run for elective office in this country are the lowest form of wretched scum that exists in this society. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you say something about those streets? <laughs> yeah. They sell our parking for yeah. a billion dollars. Well, Why don't you yeah, say I'll, something? I'll, yeah. Let me, let me answer you this way, and I have no expectation that this answer will satisfy you. <laughs> Here's why. Because it isn't about them. It's about if we got rid of them, someone would come along, take their place, okay. and do the same say thing. Say something about them, too. <laughs> they're human beings who are doing these things, and they're responsible, they're accountable for what they've done. They're not. No, they're not. They get away no, they're not. With who do they answer to? All right. Right. What, here's what I'm telling you. I believe the system is set up to promote yeah. that happening. Yeah, right. I agree we with that. we got to change the system. I agree with that. It's the system. That's all I can really tell you. All right, Louder, please. You're doing fine so far. I speak Russian. Say it in Russian. Please, say it. So my question is, learning what all politics are corrupt, and money spent, not what is supposed to be spent, and deficit, and loans, and all that. Then can you tell me what would be point then to vote, to do vote? Who to vote for? Yeah. Everybody corrupt. So can you give me a small idea? Yeah, like, I can. Because it's new to me. No, I'm citizen. Yeah. That's what I try to learn in this question. But I don't know who to vote. I'm, I'm, I don't know who to vote anymore. Yeah. Here, here's this is jail. This is this government jail. He'll give me jail. Now look at this. Two politics, Republican, this rounder, and the Republican. What for? What's the name? All of them corrupt. Okay. Who should I vote for? All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you asked me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I think. I don't think they're all corrupt. I think there's a lot of people living in a very corrupt system. 
I don't think they are. Here's how I do it. I look at, at what people, uh, uh, the people's record, do they support the things that are important to me? And the, right now, the most important thing is, do they support regulating big money and politics? I look at that. That, for me, that's the acid test. That's the most important thing. And I'll vote for who is going to promote and support that. Thank you so much. Charlie? Yeah, just yesterday I got a call from Nancy Pelosi, and I gave her 25 bucks. Excuse me. Now, you don't like that kind of stuff, I guess, right? So I did something wrong, I guess? I mean, this is you had a lot of data. This is a transparent process. So what's your complaint about? This is not... This, it's not corrupt, it's not hidden. You've got a congressional quarterly and look up every cent that everybody got. So what's the problem? Well, well some is dark. And I, they can do the same as me. Here, here's what I think. We have a system that makes it so that it's necessary to keep you up for 25 bucks over and over and over. And for Nancy Pelosi to go to big money people and say, I need uh, half a million dollars. And then she's beholden to them. So that's, that's the problem. problem. I'm not telling you you did something bad or wrong. Absolutely not. That's one of the ways that you can have your voice heard. So what's the cutoff? Where yeah, you what, is it a matter of scale? How about $30? I don't pay $30 yeah. at a time, y'all. Yeah. <coughs> no, nah, let okay, him speak. I have a question. I, mean, I just want to make a comment, but I'm bad. He's in a bad yeah. Crossroads. How much? We're not talking to you now. You have to uh, wait. I, 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 you I have to wait and, I, and, and I call did, them. I All right. Crossroads. Play how nice. Many are, how them. many elections did <laughs> Crossroads win? How many elections did Crossroads win? In the last election cycle, none. How the election cycle before that? I don't know. Calm the down. election cycle before that. <laughs> You're really upset. What's Calm going on? Down. You're attacking free speech, and you don't have a oh, number. You are already. attacking free stroke. speech, right. and that is the issue here. That's your view. That no, I'm it is no, definitely no. the issue. You want to cut off free speech because twenty-five dollars well, is okay, but twenty-six dollars no, no, might not be okay. Wait a second. Is there something you want from me on this? Okay. Excuse me. I have a one fool at a time. One fool at a time, sir. Did you have a question, madam? Yeah. I, I had, a, I had a, a kind of a comment. Or just a comment. We'll hey, have, hey, one fool at a time. We'll have a chance. Hey, I'm being respectful. I'm asking a question. You were not of order. You were being a fool. I will get the bouncing point of order. I'm the question of order. I will see you in a moment. All right. There will be a repeat. Yeah, she's not making a comment. I would like to respond to this gentleman. I would like to respond to this gentleman. You're clearly very upset about this. Right? I'm upset about attacks on free speech. I got it. I heard you say that loud and clear. I've got it. Now, here's what I want to say to you about that. I see it differently than you. I don't see this as attacking free speech. I see this as promoting democracy. I understand you don't see it the way I see it, and I don't see it the way you see it. This is not about wrong and right. We do see things differently. And I want to tell you something else. This gentleman just helped us to see something. This is what goes on when we talk about politics. We get visceral about it, and it's very difficult to talk with one another about it. Have you noticed that? How quickly conversations de and escalate into something very, very difficult to deal with. Because we do care passionately about this. <laughs> I there are good psychological a, reasons for it. It's well founded, but here's what I'm telling you. If you want to have if you want to learn, if you want to advance others' learning, you gotta recognize that people feel attacked very quickly and very easily. My guess is you felt attacked by some of what I said. No, no, no you didn't. All right, let's move on. No. All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, I've heard you. I truly have heard you. I think you're attacking the first moment. I get that. I hear you. I hear you while we're talking. Have you responded to it? Well, I would like to ask how two different conversations have occurred. I would like to ask how two different contributions are equivalent. Dark money, where you don't know how much is given and who contributed it, from small contributions up to $200 that I might make that I have to say who I am, what my occupation is, and I would like to know how those two are equivalent to have the same effect. Yeah, well, I think they are not equivalent. 
I think that's really uh, the real issue. And perhaps that addresses Charlie's uh, question about 25 bucks and is he doing something wrong? Yeah, yeah. I'm worried now. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, I live in Chicago. I don't live in land and I don't live in area. I live on the north side of Chicago. Your flyer here for multiple men says later Chicago North. Yes. And I'm not quite sure what that is, but it says Deerfield, which is the next county over. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything closer to Chicago? Yeah, plenty. And I need some help with this because I don't know where to go. I don't have addresses for you. I can get them. I'd be glad to supply them. Terry, can you provide any direction on this? Well, okay. it, it's, well maybe we can talk afterwards. Yeah. Uh, it, is there to amend in Chicago? Uh, uh, Yes, it is. We had a girl that all over the country. Yes, 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 yes. 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 We had a speaker before. Yeah. Yeah. Here's how to find it. You go to movedomen.org and the locations are listed right there. And contact people and numbers right there for you. Move to amend.org. Amend All right. Do you know what the Constitution says That's about the rules of the Supreme Court? And when um, oh, Supreme Court justices can what be impeached? Nothing. Don't I, do not. I think that's very relevant. There's some who argue that um, that that we, uh, what they did in this particular case is they change the case, as you said, right. um, and uh, this is not what the Supreme Court is supposed to do. It's just supposed to hear cases that come, that rise to its level. Yeah. And if they, and if they uh, institute new cases, um, they're committing an impeachable offense, according to some legal opinion uh, that I've read. And this might be a strategy to pursue. Thank you. Russell, at some point you had a question. Did you get, get it out? Uh, no, I... All right. I went out for a smoke. Okay, go ahead. What is the best way to deal with to make sure this is done fully bipartisan? If you're going against the Koch brothers, we should also be going against George Soros. They're not equal. There's no it such. is equal. There's no equal. It's, it's my time to speak. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But we need to make sure we're not just going after one side to help the other side win. Yeah. A full nonpartisan of. We need to be equal on both sides. Can okay. I ask what? Is there a question you want me to address about that? Yes. How do we make sure? We keep it bipartisan and not just go after the the one that backs one side or the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a constitutional <coughs> amendment will accomplish that. That's nonpartisan. Okay. Senator Just very briefly, to, I think to answer this gentleman's question, I think uh, judges, uh, Supreme Court judges, can are, are in office during good behavior, quote unquote, mm -hmm. according to the Constitution. I think they would have to commit an outright crime. So their behavior as judges, as long as it's legal. I don't think we'll think it's get them. I think it's more than that. I think it's more than that. The Supreme right. is supposed to do certain things and not okay. other things. All right. Well, all right. Is that directed to you? Uh, are you? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think you let oh, me know more about it than I do. Uh, all, right. all right. Charlie? Yeah, this ties in the rust. Wouldn't your constitutional amendment make it possible for one party to manipulate the electoral process in their favor? such as the Democratic Party has done in the city of Chicago for years. Is there anything that precluded from happening? Well, I, I, mean, it, I don't it, see it, 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 but apparently you're seeing I mean, something. My, my, I mean, I'm trying to think of the term for authorization. Uh, but there'd be no check on what could be legislated. Well, Regarding elections, the issue of an amendment is to make a, make a <coughs> clear statement that our governmental bodies can regulate uh, contributions and expenditures. That is to say, contributions can be no greater than this amount, for example. That's that's nonpartisan. All right. All right. Uh, One more thing. Do you have uh, any information uh, looking at other countries, how their democracy being influenced uh, by big money? Yeah, uh, no, I don't. No. I don't. I mean, I know a little bit about some various places, but that's no hard information that would satisfy your needs. 
your question. Oh my God. All right, Joey. Uh, you know, it so sounds to me like the Citizen United should be called, uh, labeled something different since they went beyond the scope of it should be called the Citizens United uh, like add on. We don't have a label, whatever, kind of legal term. Uh, what do you think? We should be, I know that we shouldn't be called it Citizens United. Yeah, I, I get your point, but I don't think that the uh, Supreme Court has the ability to change the name of the case. Okay. Okay, let's go to what bottles, Brown. And if Citizens United... I have no... Uh, what kind of desserts are available? I mean, One second. It sounds like us Americans wanted that. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's... The propaganda is powerful stuff. All right. Okay. Point of information, what time is it? It's 8.15, we got to get to rebuttals. Yeah, we got to get to rebuttals. <clears throat> Let's thank How our speaker. How many people here have remarks to make for our general enlightenment? I got a clock here. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, that, that's we have All right, buddy. speakers. I got to All right. Uh, first rebutter is Gene Harker. And a boy, Gene. There you are. I got up here first. I That's right. Of course, I can't see what I've got written down. Uh, but I've been working on move to amend. This is. Uh, excellent presentation, excellent. But I'll tell you what, I probably grossly knew about 80% of it. Uh, so it's, and probably the people here know about this too. So it's no big surprise. But it's going to make a, a major effort to do this. And I agree with the idea that it's the system. Uh, I remember years ago, Roy Kaur, dead and gone now for these many years, he and I would argue about that, and I think he's right. It was the system. So uh, right now, as far as I'm concerned, of course, I have a big advantage over some of you. I'm 76 years old. I'm not going to be here that long. So uh, I'm going to do what I can while I'm here. But as far as I'm concerned, we don't have a democracy. We don't even have a plutocracy. We've got an oligarchy here. It's a mess. I'll work on it. I hope some others do too. But I'm not going to hold my breath. Next in line, notice for the benefit of newcomers, uh, if you grab a seat close by here, uh, I will call on you. All right. I'm Michael Foley. The speaker said a lot of good things that should be said, but I do believe the problem with this whole situation is the fact, I'll speak about the men. The vast majority of the men who run for elective office in this country are the lowest form of despicable vermin that exists in our society. There are certain truisms of life. In the United States of America, government exists to provide rights for politicians and jobs for precinct captains. And I'm not opposed to a precinct captain having a job. Also in the United States of America, government exists to destroy people's lives. That's what it does. Now, one of the problems in this country is that a very, very large majority of people in this country absolutely love what's going on. They're very happy with what's going on. A very large majority of people who live in this country want to be oppressed. They're happy being oppressed, they want to be oppressed, and they vote for oppression. The majority, a large majority, a vast majority of people in this country who vote, vote for Republicans and Democrats. And they're the ones that are doing it to us. And people keep voting for them over and over again. They re-elect the vermin that's there. And you, they just cannot conceive 
for voting for somebody who's, a, who's not a Republican or a Democrat. Another fact of life in this country is if you vote for a Democrat or if you vote for a Republican, you're voting for sodomy. Because that's, because that's what they do to it. And the people of this country love it. Every election they go and they re-elect most of the people. And if they vote, I'm not tired of this guy, I'm getting rid of this guy. They'll vote for somebody else, but they'll vote for a Republican or a Democrat that's running against the guy. All right. There's another thing I said, I said it last week, again, about the men who run for office in this country. The vast majority of men who run for any office in this country are already some kind of big shot. They've got some kind of money, some kind of power, they're some kind of high-level official in government, or they're successful in business, they've got money in their pocket. The quickest way for these men to become a bigger big shot is to run for elective office, and the best way for them to become a super big shot is for them to win elective office, be an elected official, and they have plenty of money then. And don't underestimate the power of oral sex. That's why these guys run for office. They want lots and lots more money to bankroll their whores. They all got them. They're, well, some got female whores, some got male whores. But anytime there's a scandal, there's illicit sex. They all got a fine wife and fine wonderful kids living in a suburb somewhere, and they all got their whores downtown with them. Campaign contributions is a way to bankroll their whores. Put her on the payroll or put her on your buddy's payroll. We all know that bribery is illegal, and the politicians know it too. That's why they decided to invent the phrase campaign contribution. Campaign contributions are legal, lawful. They take bribes, but they call it campaign contributions, and they brag about it. It's got more than four minutes. Hey, okay, I'm done. He's got about Thank ten you. seconds left. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> That is, what are you running for? Not me. They say a man thinks for a long time. Why do you think I'm such a despicable creature that I would do such a thing? I'm not the nicest guy in the world, but I am not a low form of scum, slime, and vermin like those people running for elective office. All right. All right. Next. Next. A man thinks for a long waste. <laughs> Brings a whole new meaning to the form of deposit. <laughs> I'm not sure I quite know how to follow that. Um, <laughs> I would say I would say the following, however, with regard to the question that was raised about the authority of the court and the Supreme Court, I looked through the Constitution just now, and it's very vague as to just what the Supreme Court can do and cannot do, which I think was left kind of that way on purpose. So as much as I dislike the Citizens uh, United case, and as much as I might uh, accuse certain conservatives of hypocrisy, because how many times in the 60s when I was a teenager, when the Warren Court handed down some decision that they didn't like, how many times did I hear these folks start hollering about how the court was legislating from the bench. Right. And now, and yet, and yet when you put these people in power, they do the same goddamn thing. Um, or yes, or worse. But having said that, no, I don't think what they did was an impeachable offense. I think that's just something that we're just stuck with. Unless, A, we get your amendment <laughs> through Congress and the legislatures, or B, Unless some of these clowns up there, like, and you, I won't name names, you know the ones who I mean, uh, retire, and either President Obama or some future Democratic president can put people of more moderate views on the Supreme Court than currently are there now. Um, with regard to the downward spiral that you talked about, that's been going on for the past 50 years. That's been going on since President Kennedy was killed. He was, this country's been going down the tubes ever since then. And he was the last president I think we had who did take risks for this country. And he was the last president also 
who really knew the lay on the line hard to big business. Uh, there's some people who are trying to say, well, he was a conservative president. And that's bullshit. Anybody who remembers who remembers in 1962 when the steel industry tried to ram through an inflationary price hike, President Kennedy did some things that some of us would frown on now, but were, uh, uh, were legal or at least within the scope of possibility then. I mean, President Kennedy, no, that was in 1962. President Kennedy did practically everything but threaten the steel industry heads with bodily harm. He began to call these people in at the IRS, call these people in for tax audits. And as he himself said, my father always taught me that businessmen were sons of bitches, but I never believed him until now. Um, His father knew. That's right. You got, one minute, you got one minute left. Ma'am, you're not the one who's timing this. That's oh, Tim's job, not yours. We got a, we got a, uh, we got a timer over here. Oh, I didn't know. All right. All right. And I think, however, that concludes pretty much everything else that I have to say. Okay. And I thank you. All right. All right, Pat. Don't get him up the rebels. Yeah. That guy's been standing there. Look, one here too. Robert, he's been standing there. Oh, uh, Neil. Neil. Neil, go ahead, Neil. Neil. Hurry up. Well, here. You guys got nothing to say anyway. So <laughs> blood. <laughs> so okay. Let me at least see him with the camera there. It, it was an excellent presentation, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I do suggest that that you make it a little bit more flexible. Um, at least for a fair number of people here, we didn't learn very much, but this is a, a somewhat skewed group, but most groups are. Um, perhaps um, editing, stretching, or contracting for different audiences would, would work. But um, I guess I, I have an observation about some of the crowd responses, something which seems very clear to me but I really can't account for is that one of the things that seems to characterize the hard right is becoming extremely emotional without being aware that they're being extremely emotional. And I, I, I don't quite understand the psychology there, but people can get very, very rapidly, get very, very worked up without being aware that they're, they're very worked up. And uh, that, that uh, in, in, as far as I see it, or as I'm exposed, it seems to be uh, characteristic of large fractions of the right, not, uh, not the left. Um, I wonder why that is, but, but boy, it can get in your face. Here for two reasons, only going to take two minutes. One is, yes. thanks for the speech. I saw Richard Wright's uh, picture, yeah. and he was wrong with you, and you wrong with him. And there are a lot of others that say the same thing. But for whatever reason, people don't like the truth. The other reason, the thing I, I want to say is kind of like a rebut, and that is you made your uh, vote it. So why not go to vote and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the guy in charge, that's what he tells you. He wants you out to vote. Uh, I don't understand that at all. In, in fact, his propaganda is, oh, you're free, you can vote, blah, blah, blah. But who do you vote for? Ike and Mike? He select before you elect? I, I mean, give me a break, please. Uh, 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 sec uh, sec can I take this, honey? The people that run. One more beer. It, I can't vote for. Yes. Is anybody at Goldman Sachs they gonna let me vote for? Is they gonna let me vote for but at the, at the uh, reserve, a federal reserve? Uh, no, I can't vote for that. These are the type of people that have hijacked our co uh, country and they run it. Now, when I can vote for them, then I'll go back and look in the, the, the woods that I throw that vote card and try to re recover it. Until then. I'm not going to vote, because if I want to be part of a comedy show, I'm going to go down to Seven City. 
Now, people, I'll mention the second reason I'm up here, and that is because they told me if you repeat something enough of time, then you, you stick with you and you remember and so forth. We don't have a goddamn government. It's been stolen, and if you vote, and if you operate within this imaginary government that you think you have, you're wasting time. speaker said that a vote for the Democrats or the Republicans is a vote for sodomy. Right. <laughs> I recoil at that because regardless of your party affiliation, you also have to recoil at the fact that one of the major perversions is so enshrined. Uh, what about the others? You know, uh, why only sodomy? Speaking of preferential, speaking of preferential uh, treatment, uh, the Hobby Lobby case, which is heading to court real fast, was brought up tonight. That should scare all of us. It's bad enough that corporations are regarded under the law as persons uh, who apparently are immune from the penalties any other person in this room would have to suffer if they committed a crime, and that could be imprisonment or death. When was the last time you heard someone propose that a firm on Wall Street uh, be eliminated and therefore corporately put to death? It hasn't happened. It's not likely to happen. But it's something that we have to consider if we carry the law to its logical implications. Another thing, the Hobby Lobby argument against having to carry insurance for its employees, which include contraception and, uh, I believe, abortion services, they argue that it offends the religious sentiments of their corporation. They are arguing that a corporation can have a religion. So yeah. therefore, are we going to have corporations which are listed as Baptist? Are we going to have corporations which are listed as Jewish? Are we going to have corporations which are listed as Catholic or, or whatever? Uh, that gets a little bit frightening. Now, again, my mind being as warped as it sometimes gets, I have to wonder if they really want to be religious entities, persons with a religion, Will they be made to suffer the consequences <laughs> that most religions believe befalls the evil people in the next world? Uh, will certain Wall Street corporations, in fact, burn in everlasting fire, <laughs> or at least for 50,000 years? Uh, and again, a speaker said that, you know, it's useless to vote. We can't change anything. <coughs> a famous Irish parliamentarian said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men, and I think he would have included good women, do nothing. Edmund Burke. And speaking of parliamentarians, I think we at the College of Complexes have long realized we are not the British Parliament. So I would remind my right honorable fellow members, we do not get to heckle or interrupt speakers. We rather await our turn. Uh, if you want to behave that way, get elected to the British Parliament <laughs> or get elected to the Irish Doyle. You'll be in, 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 good, uh, in good shape in both places. Here, you here. Get here, here. And with that, my oh, lord. Oh, we heckle every <laughs> <here. laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our speaker for a great talk. Okay. Um, I think you're right on. Hey, guys. Oh, nice talking about no noise. Order! 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 At the very beginning of your talk, uh, you mentioned that uh, people have rights and the uh, legislature and Congress have obligations and limitations. 
You didn't mention that the legislature and Congress and the president have power. The Congress, uh, excuse me, the Constitution gives them huge powers to raise armies, to tax us, to regulate commerce. As a matter of fact, their powers are practically unlimited. They have vast powers. Thank you. Uh, and these powers are in the hands of a relatively small number of people, a total of like 550 people, Congress, the Supreme Court, and the president. These people are elites. They're either rich people or tools of rich people. And this is the essential problem. The separation of powers that the uh, Constitution uh, created, that the founders uh, made up, uh, it just creates a many-headed monster. It's all the same monster. It's a, a ruling club, a power elite. Uh, the politicians are recruited into this power elite. So that's the, that's the essential problem. The people are always behind the eight ball. Uh, these uh, terrible laws go on, fracking goes on, whatever, and you know we come by years later trying to correct something that's already way, uh, way along the way. And that's, that's the essential problem that we have. We do not rule. The people do not rule. Uh, the government is not ordinary people. It's a big money game, as you mentioned many times, as we all know. And the reason is that it's, the power is concentrated in a few individuals, and you can get to those individuals through money. And that's why the rich people control uh, government, because they control a handful of individuals. So I suggest that the solution to this problem that we have is a completely different kind of system, where you have an actual democracy, where you have community assemblies, where ordinary people in huge numbers, in the millions, get together and uh, make decisions uh, to, by themselves, for themselves. Uh, because you, you can corrupt uh, 550 people, and they're all corrupted, or, uh, pretty much. Even if they're not bad people, they're corruptible. If, the, if they're not already corrupt when they get in there, they're corruptible, and they become uh, corrupt. So you need people, power in the hands of, of ordinary people, and that's actual democracy. And it would be a completely different kind of constitution. So we don't need to amend the constitution. We need to replace this constitution. Thank you. Yes, the Hobby Lobby case scares me very much. Corporations are not people. Corporations should not have religious rights like you or I do to have a right of conscience, because it means they get to force their religion on their employees, and I think that is wrong. I happen to be a Catholic, as I've said before. I do not want to be able to tell my employees they can't take birth control, and that's what this case is about, by the way. Four types of birth control, two IUDs, Plan B and L, of which, by the way, Hobby Lobby's insurance covered before. Now they suddenly have a conscience about covering it. Oh, it's an abortifacient, they say. No, it is not. The FDA says differently. They're interpreting it wrong. I think we're going to have a very activist decision that's going to give corporations the rights they shouldn't have. Moreover, on people, we're going to suddenly have a bunch of conscientious corporations that want to deny certain things like blood transfusions and counseling and other stuff, or the Christian scientists are the worst of this. They don't believe in modern medical science at all. So who are we going to say no to once this happens? No. And what allows this case? The Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993, which was passed in a re as a reaction to Smith Employment Division versus Smith, because it told the, the former employee Smith that he couldn't use peyote, which was already a, an illegal substance. And he therefore got denied unemployment benefits. And so this is part of my religion. They said, no. And Scalia got it right in this case. He said, if we allow this, each man becomes a law unto himself because of his religion. And that we cannot allow because we have no commonly applicable laws. So, yes, the money and politics thing is very important. But we've got closer to home problems that are going to happen first that we need to fix before we have bigger problems with people. Thank you. Oh, who am I giving this to? Waitress. Don Ritchie. Okay, thank you. All right, it's a good presentation. Um, this is really interesting because we've had, uh, very apropos because we, this is our second program in two consecutive weeks on the subject of campaign finance. Now, um, uh, last week we had a speaker on on the on the issue of um, on the issue of uh, of the public financing of campaigns, and today we have a speaker who moved to amend. Now, um, now I have we, we have a gentleman here earlier who uh, who said during the uh, or said something that implied during the question and answer session that that money is the same thing as free speech. 
Uh, now, and, and since since the Constitution, or the, since the First Amendment is supposed to uh, is supposed to prohibit any kind of restrictions on free speech, uh, which it actually doesn't. It only bans Congress from restricting free speech. But in any event, um, yeah, but if you take it to mean all of the um, uh, all of government in the U.S., state, federal, and local, then does that mean that the next time I get pulled over for speeding on Lakeshore Drive, that it's okay for me to give the cop a hundred bucks to make the whole thing go away? <laughs> you know, I, I don't see why. I mean, I know people call this bribery. People call this bribery. But I think that this could be called free enterprise. The, the police need to make a living too, right? And they, yes. my understanding is that back in the old days in Chicago, like before I was born, that this kind of thing went on uh, all the time here in, the, in this city. Yeah. So now, if it's okay, if, if it's not okay to bribe cops, as Dave Zucker says here now, why is it okay to bribe politicians? Oh, because they call it campaign contributions. Okay. So, so let's. Um, I think this is a very serious issue. I spoke on this before, like the last time. Um, at uh, last week's college, um, and um, one of our speaker tonight said that uh, we need to act, or the uh, I don't remember exact what your exact wording was, but otherwise other people, I think what the the, the plutocrats, the, 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 the rich and powerful, would be the only ones talking. I think there's an argument to be made that they already are the only ones talking. If a tree falls in a forest and nobody hears it, is there a sound? Maybe not, because maybe for a sound to exist, there has to be a receiver and not just a transmitter. Uh, now. If you've got only one side of a debate that controls all the microphones, in other words, that controls the media, then, then basically, as far as most Americans are concerned, the other side of the argument ceases to exist. Uh, am I running out of time here? Or what's well, the deal? Well, you still got about a minute left, Don. You're wrong. You got okay. about a minute now, left. Let's take this group, for example, Move to Amend. I mean, our speaker tonight mentioned that, that, that very few people have even heard of Move to Amend. Um, and now I think there's a little bit more that you all could do to get your get your name out there, get get the name of your organization out there, and let people know, publicize it. But but still, there's a kind of and Andy has talked about this, a kind of conspiracy of silence. I wouldn't exactly call it a conspiracy, but most of our media is either corporate owned or corporate sponsored, and certainly the most listened to and read media. And and so they tend to cater to the interests of large corporations. And so they're not going to publicize things that run contrary to those interests. So, now, uh, Mike earlier said, don't vote for, you know, he said that uh, voting for the Democrats and for Republicans is a vote for sodomy. Um, now, one of the problems is if you vote for somebody other than the Democrats or the Republicans, in most cases, that person is not going to get elected. And, uh, and in fact, what you were doing then is you're acting as a spoiler against somebody who might not be so bad who could get elected. And now, I would also just say that I, you know, although I've said some pretty negative things about politicians in the past, uh, I do not believe that all politicians are completely bad. Um, I think I, in my own, my own personal estimation is only 99% of Republicans and two thirds of Democrats. <laughs> Trail actively talking to our voters. Okay, I'm glad to see that. That's better than average. So I'll make my point. I actually had more confidence, possibly, than people speaking here. I particularly have confidence in people under the age of 40. People under the age of 40 have done a lot with their time and with the limited money because they don't have as much money as people that are older, and they are wanting change. So in the nature of hope, I'd like to express that. And I think it's very important to get them out and talk about voters' rights because there is a big difference between Senator Liz Warren, for instance, and Scalia. We know that some of our people are more interested in their future. There's also a big difference in our science community. I'm from the medical community, and believe me, all of the scientists from the EPA and most of us that are in positions for social responsibility tip towards the party that will allow more voters' rights. So I'm in favor of you people out there, but you are high information no, no voters. I really believe you can help us to explain to our people 
I'm very hopeful about people under 40. I do know we're making strides against people like their co-brothers. We are making them, but it takes courage for all of us to get out there, and we're going to have to make incremental decisions. I encourage you to vote. I think voting is very important. And I think most people that are younger would agree with me. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Yes. All right. Um, let's let's thank Jack again for being here. Jack, you be here a little early. But I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, uh, Mr. Ritchie, uh, campaign contributions have to be spent on campaigns. And there's a congressman in jail right now because he didn't understand that. So you were perhaps not accurate. I'll just say it that way. You were not accurate that <laughs> this is well, Mike Royko, money. With, Mike uh, Royko said, now I, I Mike got Royko said campaign contributions. <laughs> <Moderator. laughs> <laughs> One pull at a time. Uh, One pull at a time. time. I like to One pull at a time. I train my mic right. Hey, Honorable hey, friend hey, is out of order. <laughs> Tell me, shut up. <laughs> all right. Uh, the other thing is, all right, we got that out of the way. Yeah, it's a transparent process. I've been lobbying for many, many years, and at the at this game, um, the other thing I might say, you were emphasizing their accessibility. I don't think that that's that difficult. Uh, that it costs a million dollars to have accessibility to. The congressional aid or the congressman and things like that. I don't think that's the case. But that's a little adjustment I would make in your program. The other thing is, um, this is not, I just lectured here on the American Revolution. Some of you were lucky enough to be here that night. <laughs> but <laughs> this situation, now you'd said this was like, Tom Payne was in the American Army, yeah. I don't know how, but they were being chased by the British out of New York and they were running for their, so they wouldn't be captured and he wrote this little thing, he called it there from the, the crisis paper. I don't know if we're quite at that situation here. We have issues at hand, but I don't think the very future of our nation is, is um, the you know, no, it's not. And what's he doing quoting that filthy atheist anyway? <laughs> uh, anyhow, I said I'd be eclectic here. Um, but the, the, the other thing I noticed here, even in your own literature, you said you, 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 are, you have issues here, and you get into partisan politics in the back page. If you're commendable, you're going against XL and so forth. But Jim, right here, you say write letters, sign petitions, attend rallies. There is a way to influence politics. I've known for many, many years, lobbying Congress assiduously, many organizations, that the guy, I often get this quote that was with my friend, and the guy was coming out of the congressman's office, and my friend turned to me and said, he just gave him $50,000. I've never had the fifty. I mean, you changed no, that. Oh, no, no. oh, okay. um, to influence legislation and positive legislation. And this is what there are alternative ways of doing this. I'm not going to. Should the system be corrected most assiduously? Is it an unfair advantage? But work within the system you got. And I'm I'm not the, at the crisis point yet. I don't think our nation, though you certainly, not to diminish your efforts, but getting amendments is not an easy process, admittedly, you know that yourself. I have to tell you about it. And last of all, your recommendation here, in order to affect change, you say, talk to, talk to your neighbor, I've talked to my neighbor, my loony neighbor has <laughs> weapons and guns. It is of uh, no value whatsoever. <laughs> to talk to this guy. And your time <laughs> is up, Charlie. Your time <laughs> is up. Anyhow, all right. Thank you uh, again. Talk to my neighbor. I don't They're crazy. <laughs> Isn't that a fruitcake? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a very, very good fact-based, fact -based, reality-based presentation because we hear some presentations here that are not so much based in reality some nights, and yours was great. And I think um, I myself you know, learned a lot of things, tidbits in there and references to look for that I didn't know about, although I, I've been you know, on the same page as you with a big picture for a while. And uh, as you heard from several of the comments, some people think that maybe our government is influenced by money to a certain degree. No. <laughs> no. Um, well, you got your fix. One of the, what we've been, we've been inundated with huge money, or rather our congressmen and senators and congressmen and judges have been showered in money for the last 40 years, and the tobacco industry pioneered the technique. There's a, a famous picture of the guys uh, with their hands up testifying before Congress in 1994 saying, we see no evidence that nicotine is addictive. And uh, right. you know, it's like, Your Honor, the earth is flat, trust me. Um, repositioning, well, the quote was, doubt is our product since it is the best means of combating and competing with the body of fact. Once facts become overwhelmingly solid, scientific, you know, forensic evidence is documented, you can no longer combat the body of fact, then you pay politicians and others to give speeches and create doubt. And that's what we've had in this country for the last four years on key issues. They've showered us with money over the last 50 years to promote the idea that, of course, JFK was killed by Oswald. It wasn't that way. Um, We've been told that uh, our soldiers, that one of the biggest myths that Americans are living under right now is that our patriotic young people in the Marines and the Army are fighting for freedom and justice in foreign lands. Nothing can be the truth. The farther, a million, trillion dollars a year going down the rat hole. And on global warming now, uh, the quote is from the fossil fuel industry, reposition global warming as theory rather than fact. I've given 12 fact-based talks here in the last six years. More talks than anybody else at the college in the last six years. And they've all been fact-based, reality-based. Uh, my hobby is translating books, not from Japanese or German to English, but I'll take books like this one. That uh, This is censored news. A database. Take a wheelbarrow full of paper. 10, 20 books. Might take you three years to read that. Translate it down into one-page cliff notes that somebody can read in five minutes because there's no time for people to read 15 or 20 books a week. On certain key issues, there's a massive database, like on asbestos and cigarette smoking, but this book describes <coughs> how the press runs a two-pronged process. They promote the myth, and they run a coordinated blackout at the same time. That's why you can have conscientious, Many, many conscientious, well-meaning people live their whole lives without being exposed to certain kinds of things that are common knowledge in other countries. As I said, we have, I talk to journalists all the time that don't know that Project Censored exists out there. Uh, about half of the American public is still under the impression that uh, the Twin Towers in New York were brought down by plane crashes when the forensic evidence has been solid for a decade. Those all three buildings went sideways in the wind of the cloud of dust. So America would be different if we didn't have the Patriot Act dumped on Congress and signed without any being able to read it. Congress was not able to read the Patriot Act when it was signed. So. Everything that is being driven, uh, you know, happening in our country, you know, pushing toward a police state, is being driven by that Patriot Act and our loss of civil liberties and everything else, and the, the loss of the right. You know, whistleblowers are being prosecuted. Whistleblowers don't have free speech either. So um, the first, I agree with the speaker totally. The last thing I would say was, the first thing is face reality, learn what's happening. Learn the actual facts and help your friends and neighbors learn. Because it's not in the media, it's not in the papers, not on radio and TV. Thank you. All right. Very good. Very good. He's got my vote. Okay, Lee Ping. Lee Ping over here, Ed. Oh, yes, Lee Ping. I'll sell my vote. Can I sell my vote? I just make a point that can't be had, but it can be bought. Anybody want to uh, buy my vote? I just want to make it quick. I think, uh, uh, as I said in the previous uh, days, uh, democracy is based on technology. 
if there's no paper, no newspaper cannot spread the information, then there's no uh, democracy. And now we have more ways technology can spread the information, like internet. So I think uh, time is there. For everybody of us, we should be able to vote directly to pass some law or not. Then we don't have to rely on those middlemen and uh, no. take our uh, no. opinions and, uh, and get money for them. No. At least uh, for, for some uh, TV shows, uh, people can just uh, use a phone and uh, click some button and uh, vote for their wishes. Never. I think eventually that would be the the dominant uh, election yeah. message for everybody, especially the young people. They, they they are not scared of technology. I know there are lots of old people. They're scared of uh, this uh, technology. Is everything is uh, in a black box? But uh, I think that's uh, will be solved. Is okay? Definitely, there's a way to solve that. So there are 2,500 laws in Congress right now. <laughs> How are we going to vote on them all? If hey, people will uh, be allowed to vote, uh, those laws has to be written very short, precise, and uh, people can read. Otherwise, those, those will be voted down. So by natural elimination. I'll I think uh, this uh, move to amend is a, a very good approach in, in a way that uh, put more people reliable, uh, realize they are the driving, they are in the driving seat, and uh, we want to be in the driving seat. Thank you. Okay. Come on up. All right. All right, let's see about that. Okay, I'll see you next week. For something to be free, you have to in Russia. You should be able to go get it as, as often as you want. There should be an infinite supply of it. And this is not true of money. So therefore, uh, money cannot, not being free, cannot equal free speech. But money is only distributed unequally. And so it's, uh, it's an illogical position to say, to defend uh, the uh, limitless, limitless contributions under the guise of the free speech. All right. That's it. You got, you got one more? One more. One more. Yeah. I got to get home and talk to my neighbor. <laughs> sure. All right. Ready? Go. I'll give I'll give you a one minute morning with three minutes. Thank you. My problem here is not with the, this. Is, this is a huge problem. It is undoubted that money influences politics, and it is undoubted that money is corrosive on politics, which, as you have said, is already a very filthy area that normal citizens feel that they are not able to understand or to influence. That's not the answer though, Jack, and you're a very damn good speaker, and I can see why you're making professional money off of speaking. You're damn good. You've drawn in a lot of uh, emotional things in here and said this will resolve them. It's not going to resolve them. It's an attack on free speech. Let me ask you a question. Is, is, is evolution a theory, a thing that we can discuss? What's the problem when we talk about evolution as a theory? Isn't it the definition that scientists hold about the word theory versus these people who are creationists about the word theory? It's the same thing with personhood. Personhood is a legal theory, and you have to support it for corporations. Charlie cannot get to his union members and talk about them as a group unless they are a person who can sue and who can go and be represented in a course of law or before the legislature or before the executive. Personhood is, is a big issue here. Are animals people? Well, damn right they're people. We've had animals sue for their rights to survive in this society as industrial corporations attack their ecosystem and threaten them with total extinction. So damn right 
Animals are people too. <laughs> Under the Constitution, they can sue and protect themselves. And lawyers, <laughs> human lawyers, have stood up, yes, have stood up and protected their rights. And I think that that is a confusion around this table, and I'm the only person except for maybe Charlie who gets it. This is not the answer because we have not totally exhausted all of the, re the, the, the possible ways to resolve this issue. I think Charlie was on the right track. Transparency is, is, is needed so that we understand where the money is coming from. I think you're all intelligent enough when you know the money is coming from a certain source to make a decision about how that is influencing your opinion when you hear those things. Thank you, sir. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. Charlie used the word eclectic for his comments. I'd have to say that that is a good word for all of these comments in the aggregate. Certainly that is eclectic. To speak to a couple of things, I did talk about a downward spiral. And I would argue that it really began in earnest during the Reagan years when we started being sold trickle-down economics. Um, but it is accelerated. As money and power has gone to the wealthiest people, the more that happens, the more power that they get. The more money they have, the more influence they have. To the point where the Koch brothers managed to get their hand-picked candidates on the House Energy Committee. Have you heard of Koch Petrochemicals? Yes. Yeah. They get their they yeah, get the kind of legislation, that, yeah. they get the kind of legislation they want by buying the politicians. The more money flows to the top, the more the top have power, control, and influence. So here's the thing I want to leave you with. I could comment on so many things that were said here. Keep your eye on what's most important. What is most important is ending the corrosive influence of big money in our politics. It is the mother of all of our dysfunction. All of the things that you care about that aren't going the way you want them to go, they're being affected that way because somebody's making a lot of money by preventing you from getting what you want. And as for voting, I do need to speak to this. Here's a little statistic for you from the 1960 election. If just one more person had go to, voted, gone to the polls in each precinct across the United States, Richard Nixon would have been sworn in office in January of 1961. Not one person changing a vote, just one more person showing up. That's all it would have taken. Your vote does matter. I get that you may wind up selecting between the least bad of the alternatives that you see before you. I understand that. Then vote for the least bad. It's better than getting the other guy. So I would urge you to be active. Do go out and vote. Get involved in, chain, in educating people. It's not about whether people know about move to amend. It's whether people know about the corrosive influence, influence of big money in our politics. The numbers of people who want things changed, that was about the people who know about Citizens United, which is now the poster child for big money influence in our politics. The more people know about this, the more people want this changed. It's going to take a large mass of us <coughs> to insist upon change. That, it's going to take millions and millions and tens of millions of us. So that's why I said talk about it. I get, Charlie, where are you? I get Charlie that your neighbor is a, a gun nut next door and you can't talk to him. <laughs> you want to talk to him. Don't talk to him. No. I understand what away? you're saying. But there are other people. Send them an email. <laughs> we need lots of us to know about this, and we need to take action and do something about it. That's why I showed up today. That's why I put this program together. And just so that there's no misunderstanding, your name is? Patrick. Patrick, here's what I want you to know. You asked, how much money do I make speaking? I make zero dollars doing this. Yeah. This costs yeah. me money to do this. <coughs> Three weeks ago, I was in Collinsville, Illinois, talking to a, 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 a group <coughs> down there. I did it on my dime. I don't make any money. I do this because I want to make a difference. Good for you. Good. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. I move to amend uh, that we're closed.